Today on Dielectric Videos, I'm going to build this press, which will allow me to compress melted plastic together into composite blocks, which can then be machined into other objects that can be used for various applications. So I've been working on a project recently for the lab where I work, and the goal of this project has been to make composite blocks out of ground up mixed recyclables. So this particular composite block was actually cut from a larger casting that I made in this bread pan. But as you can see, it's problematic as it contains large voids and pockets of air. This is because there is no possible way for me to apply significant pressure downward on the casting as it was being made. Instead, what I'd actually like to do today is build a system to be able to have a vertical column that I can actually have built in to this oven, which is what's actually going to apply the heat for the melt. And I'd also like to be able to build a sort of tamper that I can use to push the material down as I'm feeding it into the top of the melting pipe. So one of the ideas here is to drill a hole through the top of the oven and actually place the melting tower down into it through the hole. But the problem with this is there are heating elements on both the top and bottom of the oven. So the goal here is going to be to cut that hole just so that it's in between the two heating elements so as to not damage them. So I've marked out a location where we should just miss both heating elements on the top side of the oven when we drill the hole. Now I've gotten a, th this is a uh, bimetal cutting uh, hole saw from Amazon. It doesn't say it's supposed to be compatible with metal, so this is probably going to just be very grindy, but it hopefully will get through it eventually. We're a little bit caught on the metal here. These teeth may be too aggressive. We'll see if we can spin it up though. Yeah, it looks like it's going to try to really chew on the metal. So we'll try that one more time. It is possible we'll need a more powerful drill. The teeth are just so aggressive on this cutter. This is for plastic and wood. See if we can continue cutting through the second layer. And it's caught on something. So we'll have to pull it out a little bit and try again. We're through. Well, it's going nowhere fast. I mean, eventually it would probably get through, but I think the drill bit would dull up faster than we get through the metal. So I'm going to start taking tangent cuts, and I'll see if I can get uh, the circle extracted here. So I'll start off with one and then I'll gradually adjust the angle and see how accurate I can get. This looks a bit easier to cut. So now I've created a sort of octagon, so I think some judicious use of the angle grinder will fill, finish this off into a circle of suitable size for our application. We'll see how this fits in the pipe, and then we'll adjust it as needed. That's pretty close. We'll be able to obviously fill the small gaps with weld, and we want it to be slightly oversized so we can kind of hammer it in. That way it'll stay in place when we start tack welding it. So 
I might take a tiny bit more off just to make it a little bit smoother fit, although honestly this is more than, actually this is probably fine considering all it needs to do is clear the top of the oven. All right, so I've chucked a flap wheel into this uh, into this angle grinder, and I'm just gonna clean up the edge around where I'm gonna weld. That way the chrome is not exposed. Also go ahead and prep the surface on this uh, piece of metal that we cut out so that it's easier to weld, we don't have too much oxide on it. And we'll see if we can give it a little tappy tap tap to get in there. That should be ready to weld. I'm also going to make a second one of these circular plates, this time using the uh, cutout from the top of the toaster oven as a guide, in order to use this for the tamper rod uh, so that we can actually compress the plastic down into the cylinder. Well, this workpiece is certainly much wider than this saw is meant to cut. We'll see if Harbor Freight can pull it through. incredible performance on the part of this saw. That cut through six inches straight of quarter inch uh, of hot rolled steel. I now have a tamper that fits suitably inside the end of the tube. So I realized in retrospect that I actually had the welder set to 0.025 inch wire instead of 0.03 inch wire, which is why it was feeding out at such a high speed, which is why the welds ended up with quite a bit too much material and quite a bit too little heat. So the penetration on these is probably not great. Nevertheless though, I'm going to clean this one up and I'll grind this other weld down so that it will fit inside the oven, and if we see any holes we'll just patch them up with some more weld. You can see here, some of this weld looks relatively good, but it gets kind of splattery over here. Uh, but again, all this has to do is push down on material that's loaded into the top of this, so it's not really that important. So I've taken it down to dimension. This is going to be approximately the outside dimension of the inside of the oven. Um, as you can see, the weld is obviously not that great. Um, even a grinder and paint is not necessarily going to make me the welder I ain't. Uh, but what we really want to see is will this hold liquids? So I'm going to fill this up with water and see if we have any leaks. So I filled up the tube with water, and as you can see we have a couple of small leaks. They're all pretty much on the inside edge. So what I'm going to do is pour the water out and I'm going to run another bead on the inside of the weld and then uh, see if that stops the leaks. So now the last thing I'm going to do is cut the end of this pipe off so I can then connect them together temporarily during the melt using the coupling. So 
So now we'll get the angle grinder out, we'll clean up the edges, and then we'll make sure it all fits together inside the oven. This is a tool for honing cylinders in car engines, and it has replaceable consumable stones on it, so it might just do kind of something like what we need. So now comes the assembly time for the actual installation. So the idea here is we're gonna take our bottom cup, and this is of course where the final product plus some of the final product in the top is going to accumulate. We're gonna place the bottom cup there. In fact, maybe before we even put it in, we're gonna to wanna to put the, uh, the, what do you call it, coupling together. So this coupling comes with some parts, some hardware that you can put together like this. So, top component should slide easily through the lid. And then we want these to basically sit flush against each other. And that should do it. We are now connected. All right, I'm ready to do a test melt. So I'm preheating the oven right now. I've set the temperature control to 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which is almost at the smoke point of the cellulose paper fibers that we're going to use, but it'll make sure the polyethylene flows nicely. So initially I was planning on just doing polyethylene, but I'm also going to try, so I initially rather was going to try just low density polyethylene, but I'm also going to try mixing in some high density polyethylene. All of these are going to be film plastics. So I have measured out here 140 grams of low density polyethylene, 101 grams of high density polyethylene film. And then as my aggregate, I have some paper shreddings and the bag tears in at about six grams, totaling here to 48, let's see, some of it's falling off the edge here, 59 total grams, so about 53 grams of paper shreddings. So we've been only heating for about five minutes, but already the bottom of the pipe is at 162 degrees Fahrenheit. So as you can see, we've now exceeded 300 degrees. We're up to 314 degrees inside of the chamber. It took about 20 minutes for this to preheat and soak in to the, reach a sufficient temperature. So first I'll add maybe a handful of paper. I'll get maybe one of these and stick it in, see if we can, you know, we may have to cut this into smaller pieces, but the idea is to be able to direct feed the polyethylene. So we'll see if I can now drive that down to the bottom. Yeah, that works really well, actually. Let's see if we can see anything down inside this if we move the light. So there's a look down inside the chamber. I can't quite tell if the plastic has started melting yet, but it definitely looks like it's starting to deform on the outer edges. I'll feed some more plastic in. It's hard to know if it's getting melted, but I want to just get everything compressed down as much as we can. So I'll see if I can feed a few of these in. Now these will compact down quite a bit. It's been about 10 minutes since I've added the last bit of material since, so let's see if there's any further compaction, uh, basically if there's any signs of melting. It does look like maybe a little bit, but not as much as I would expect. I think the top levels aren't getting enough heat to properly melt. I just turned on the broiler setting on the oven. That should potentially improve the amount of heat transfer into the top section of the uh, tube because the top elements of the oven are going to be turned on now. Looks like we've finally reached the critical temperature. It's been close to 40 minutes now since I first started, but when I pushed the tamper down this time, it actually sunk considerably down into the material. This indicates we've reached the melting point and a majority of the material is now able to flow freely into the batch. I'm also gonna try using the long or sharp end of the tamper rod to actually kind of press holes into it and mix the plastic a little bit. That might help keep some of the cooler center section, uh, move some of the cooler center section out towards the sides, and then displace some of the overheated outer section towards the middle. So I've got some paper I'm going to drop on top here. That was almost all the plastic here, at least all the low density polyethylene. That's a lot actually, so hopefully that's not going to be too much. And we're going to add it all anyway, so in it goes. 
And now we'll see for the end cap here if we can get all the rest of the HDP in. All right, so we're right around the two hour mark now and everything is pretty well melted, I think, as much as it's going to. So there you can see the bottom of the crucible there. You can see molten plastic all around the edges and just a little bit of a remnant of that Safeway bag in the middle that isn't quite melted. But that one has been there for the past probably 30 minutes and not melted. So I think when we get it this thick, it just won't, the heat doesn't quite soak all the way to the top. So that top section is just not quite gonna hit that melting point. That being said, the majority of the material through and through seems to be well melted. So we'll get to uh, take it out and see how it goes once it has cooled off. Everything's cooled down now, so I'm going to go ahead and disassemble the coupling, and then we'll see if we can actually separate the upper section of the melting tube from the lower section to expose the ingot. So I've extracted the melting column. You can see it makes a pretty good seal. We didn't have much overspray or leakage here, and you can definitely see molten plastic all around. What I'll try to do next then is separate these two it is split in half apparently it looks like we've got a pretty high paper density there and the lower section also appears to be split along this line so definitely too much paper in this version So the bottom section is really not coming out very easily, so I think what I'm going to do is drill a hole in it, use that to hammer it out, and then I'll have a sheet of some higher temperature material that I can put at the bottom during the next melt. So I managed to drill a hole through the bottom of this uh, ingot cast, so what I can try and do now is push the ingot out from this side. All right, well, I managed to get the first melt all the way out, so there's nothing left in the bottom section. However, it did come out in three pieces, separated clearly by lines of excessive paper density, through which very little plastic actually managed to pass. So it's not that the plastic didn't melt, it's just that it was so separated by paper fibers, and there was such inconsistency between the fibers, that it didn't form a strong composite. Additionally, you can see at the very end of the line at the near the top, we did get considerably more plastic, but not all of it melted. So basically, I think the bottom line here is I need less paper. I need to ensure a little bit higher temperature. And then probably most importantly, I need to make sure that the paper and plastic are well homogenized and mixed together. So definitely this system will be reusable. There'll be no issue putting this right back together and putting it back into service. And we can definitely start subsequent melts going forward.